At Metro East, we know there's a lot of great work going on in our community, and we want to share that with you. On Community Hotline, we highlight local nonprofits, schools, and government agencies that have their feet on the ground and are working to make our neighborhoods a better place. I'm your host, Monica Weitzel. On today's episode, we'll hear from two of our East Multnomah County cities about their annual festivals. The city of Gresham is bringing back their arts festival as an in-person event. The city of Wood Village is hosting their City Night Out as a hybrid of both in-person and virtual participation. We'll also talk with the Oregon Wildlife Foundation about how you can help our animal friends by doing something as easy as choosing a new license plate. And finally, we'll talk with the Metro East Education Department about their plans for the summer and a cool new toy they got to help them out. It's all coming up next on Community Hotline. The Gresham Arts Festival is back. And this is an event you can attend in person with the entire family. On this segment of Community Hotline, we talk with Sasha Cannell about what you can expect at the 2021 Gresham Arts Festival. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Today, we'd like to ask you kind of a rapid fire series of questions about the Gresham Arts Festival. Are you ready for that? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, including the years when it was called the Gresham Art Walk, how long has this been a Gresham event? 19 years, this is the 19th year. That's amazing. So due to COVID, the Gresham Arts Festival was canceled last year. Why did the city of Gresham decide to bring it back this year? Because we couldn't just cancel it forever. It's a beloved community event, so it had to come back and it is back. Great. So how many artists have signed on to show their work? We have about 100 artists that are signed up this year. We had a huge wait list. Unfortunately, we're, we weren't allowed to have everyone, but this year we have 100 of them and they're That's amazing. That's wonderful. What kind of art can we expect? There's over a dozen mediums and you'll have everything from photography, wood, sculpture, uh, painting, um, 2D. There's over a dozen of them. So I understand the artists really like uh, showing and selling their work at this event. Do you know why? Honestly, the feedback that I've received is that just the Gresham community is just so welcoming. Our volunteers are amazing and our artists just love coming to this event and love showing at this event. That's good to hear. So what's the craziest or coolest or most original art that you've ever seen at this event? Oh man, I've seen some crazy stuff, but I think I, I, I won't say my favorite, but one of the things I'm drawn to is Ron Sheldon. He's a copper impression artist. <laughs> the work that he does it's insane I've never seen anything like it and it's so beautiful so beautiful oh, sounds great what about kids is there anything for them to do absolutely we have a kids corner this year uh, put on by the pediatric therapy services and there's all sorts of things there's going to be kids crafts activities Disney princesses a clown so lots of fun stuff for the kiddos that sounds great and really important what if I get hungry at the Gresham Arts Festival <laughs> we've got you covered We've got vendors from all over the Gresham area as well as around the region. So we've got places like Spice of Africa, Three Guys Grilling, Crumble Cookie is gonna be there. So all the food, all the treats. So Sasha, do you have any sponsors for this event? We sure do. So we have our patron of the art sponsors and that's the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce and the Gresham Outlook. And then we have our curator sponsors and that's Pediatric Therapy Services, Gresham Toyota, Serve Pro, of, Serve Pro of Gresham, and then Clackamas County Bank. Perfect. Yeah. Anything else that we should know about the 2021 Gresham Arts Festival? <sighs> Absolutely. We need volunteers. So if you're willing and able to volunteer, we need you. Um, and then the big thing is that we have moved the festival to the Arts Plaza. So we're all going to be at the Arts Plaza this year. Arts Artists, vendors, Kids Village, everything's going to be over at the plaza. It's going to be a beautiful event over there. Wonderful. And just real quick, give me the, the date and the time for this event. Yes. So it is Saturday, July 17th, and it's going to go from 9 to 5 p.m. at the Gresham Arts Plaza. Wonderful. I can't wait. I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much. Thank you. And to all of you watching today, be sure to check it out. And from all of us at Metro East, be safe, stay healthy.
watch out for our furry friends the next time you take to the highway because advocates are sounding the alarm about wildlife vehicle collisions during the busy spring migration season. The Oregon Wildlife Foundation has been working on projects that connect animal habitats to enable wildlife of all kinds to move more safely around Oregon's roads. Today on Community Hotline, you'll find out how you can help support these efforts with the Watch for Wildlife specialty license plate. Joining us today to tell us more about the campaign and habitat connectivity is Kalei Augustine, the Development Manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. Thanks for being here, Kalei. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you here. So can you give us a kind of a quick overview of the a Watch for Wildlife uh, license plate campaign? Sure. Um, the Watch for Wildlife campaign goal is to support safe passage for wildlife in Oregon as they move within their natural corridors. To support safe passage, we need to support habitat connectivity. And raising awareness about wildlife needs to survive in the human built world. Mm. Um, so when we talk about connectivity, we're talking about literally how they move from habitat to habitat to survive. So are you, give me an example of, of what you're talking about when you say they move from habitat to habitat. Sure. So um, mule deer, for example, um, migrate for, um, you know, there's in the winter, they come down from the mountains. And in Oregon, for example, the mule deer have in central Oregon have to pass across Highway 97. And sometimes they move as far as from like around the Redmond area to Lapine. So it's a pretty long journey and there's a lot of busy roads in between. So what, what you're doing is trying to help them find a safe way across those roads or to where they're going without getting hit by a car, basically. Yeah. 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 So how, how does that work? How, what does that look like when you're trying to provide that safe passage? <laughs> well, um, a lot of different groups in Oregon are working on this. Um, ODOT, they build the roads, right? Um, they are well aware of this problem. And so they have installed some underpasses mm -hmm. and these are very expensive. Um, so a lot of different groups have been helping with this effort. The Oregon Wildlife Foundation has helped with the Gilchrist underpass, which is just outside of Bend under Highway 97. The infrastructure is in place. The underpass is in. All types of wildlife are, are going under it. Um, but to make it, to, to capture them all and push them under the underpass, um, a lot of fencing also needs to be installed. Um, the fencing alone is over a million dollars. So a lot of groups have, um, like the foundation, stepped up to help pay for that. So it's, it's a big project, um, but we're super happy to be involved with that. Tell us a little bit about where you're at with the campaign, though, and, and how, how, how that works. Sure. Um, so the DMV requires um, when you launch a new license plate, you have to meet their requirements, which is to um, pre-sell 3,000 of the license plates. So we're in that process. We have sold um, 2,450. <laughs> so You're we're well getting there. Way. Yeah, we only have 550 more to go. Um, it's been a really interesting project. Um, you know, the pandemic definitely slowed us down a little bit. And um, it's really picking up. Again, the, the word is getting out. I want to invite people that are watching this, if they would like a Watch for Wildlife license plate, you can go to our website and uh, sign up for one. So once once you reach that that threshold, once you've sold the 3,000, what happens then? Um, good question. So we submit all the information to the DMV, all everyone's name, because they have received these paper vouchers from us. And then um, DMV starts the production which can take up to five or six months, I've been told. We're really hoping it's faster. Um, and then they uh, start producing the plate and they're available in DMVs and our 3000 early purchasers can go down with their voucher and get their license plate and the general public can, can then start buying them as well. And, and they're really, they're really um, good looking plates. They are, yeah. yes. Yeah. Do you happen I, to have one there? I have a, a 
picture of one here. Um, it has a mule deer, it has Mount Hood behind it. It's very iconic. It says, watch for wildlife. Yeah, that's beautiful. It'll be fun to see that on, on the cars and knowing what goes on behind it because I had never had any idea how that, how that worked. Mm -hmm. So, um, so then you'll reach the goal, you'll be able to sell them. And then that money will go directly to, will it go to the Oregon Wildlife Foundation or does it get split up between other uh, organizations as well? Um, the DMV will take a, per a percentage, but the majority of it will come back to the foundation. It's, uh, I think about $35 from the 40. And this is for sales and renewals of the plates. Um, so the money will come back to the foundation. We have a project committee that will help determine which safe passage um, connectivity projects we wanna fund. Right, right, that sounds wonderful. So mm -hmm. um, before I let you go, tell me a little bit more about the Oregon Wildlife Foundation and, and how um, people can support it in addition to the license plates. Sure, um, we were started in 1981. And so this year is our 40th anniversary. We're excited about that. Um, we do a variety of things. We don't just sell license plates. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we, um, we are the fiscal sponsor for nonprofit groups that don't have their 501c3 status. So we have eight groups that we help with. Um, we work on lots of projects um, with other groups around Oregon, uh, state agencies like ODF&W or ODOT. Um, the Gilchrist underpass is a great example of that. Um, we also give grants. We give about $100,000 in grants every year to, to groups that are doing projects um, all over the state. Um, so if you have a project you want to apply for some money for, you could look at our grant requirements on our website. That's good to know. That's good to know. Cause there's a, there's a lot of people that are, that really want to work in this area, but sometimes don't know how to go about it or have the funding. So mm -hmm. that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing wonderful work at the, at the foundation there. And I really appreciate you coming on. Is there anything else, anything else you want to let us know about the importance of wildlife conservation or, or just about the foundation? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I, I just want to let people know that um, now is a really critical time in our, uh, on our planet to uh, help wildlife. Um, conservation is really important and it's available to everyone. Everyone can be a conservationist, um, whether you are planting something in your garden that will attract pollinators, that's helping the ecosystem. Um, if you want to make a donation to the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, that's a great way to help. Um, of course, the license plate is a great way to help because it's an ongoing source of funding for conservation. Um, like I said, the sale, the money from the sales um, and the renewals will, will come back to the foundation. And if you wanna just get information about conservation, if you're, you're still wanting to learn more, um, our website has tons of information. Uh, we partner with a lot of biologists, hydrologists, foresters. Um, they help create materials, content for our website. Um, we also do monthly community conservation talks that are a free online talk where you can learn about different topics. Um, recently, we did one on pollinators and we have all well, kinds of information. So. You know, I think that's a, a really good place for people to to start the conversation with their children, because kids always ask lots of questions, you know, when they're especially when they're young and they ask about, you know, why, you know, why do you kill a fly, but not a bee, <laughs> you know, or whatever the question mm -hmm. might be. But uh, there's a lot of answers there and make it easier for for parents to um, start them as conservationists at an early mm -hmm. age. Yeah, talking about like, you know, planting a native plant in the yard that will attract some some native um, wildlife. That's that's a really good topic. And yeah. of course, when kids see like a dead deer on the side of the road, you know, like there are some ways that we can help stop that or, or lessen that that animal car collision rate that's really high. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and everybody likes animals, so that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Yes, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing. Um, thank you so much, Kalei, for, for coming on here today. And I would encourage everyone who you know, is 
do to get a new license plate, or even if you're not, that go ahead and, and order this one because it's beautiful and it's going to do a lot of good. And thanks to our viewers for joining us today. Uh, be sure to check it out on their website. And in the meantime, from all of us at Metro East, stay healthy, stay safe. City Night Out at Wood Village is back. On this segment of Community Hotline, we'll hear about their new hybrid event that will include both a virtual component and a drive-through feature. Hi, here today we are with Greg Dirks, who is the city manager of Wood Village. Greg, I know that you have a Wood Village night out planned this summer. Uh, who can attend this Wood Village night out? As always, the Wood Village Night Out is open to anyone and everyone. Whether you're living in Wood Village or not, we're happy to have you as our guest and welcome you to this great event. Wonderful. When is the event? Friday, July 16th, the third Friday in July, as always. Okay. And how is this event different from previous years? Well, uh, this year we are doing a hybrid event. Uh, we have a virtual, so all of our community partners can send their, their messages, their greetings, or their services out to the community. And we also have a drive-through component uh, for some resource bags and some, some nifty gifties for the kids and families. The, the location is our typical spot, the Wood Village Baptist Church at 23601 Northeast Arata Road, and that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Great. And how about the virtual? Where will they be able to, to watch that? That will then go, uh, I'll call it live, on, on the city's website, also at 6 p.m. starting uh, Friday, July 16th. And that's our website, www.woodvillageor.gov. And we'll have that up for probably about a month because it's, those are going to be some great information and entertainment on that virtual component. Can you give me three words that will describe this event? Oh, three words. Well, I'd say fun. I'm going to hyphenate family friendly. So that's only, you know, counts as one word and then memorable. Good, good. Um, and one more thing, get back to the drive through event. What can we expect at that? You said there'd be some things given out. Is that right? Yeah. So we'll have a, a, a swag bag, for lack of a better word, for each family that, that drives up. And that will be including some, some swags from our community partners, community resources, uh, probably a, a toy or activity for kids. And we like to throw in some sort of baking item that family can go home, bake something together and enjoy it together later on. Wonderful. And who supports this event? Well, certainly the city of Wood Village, uh, but also our other partners, such as the Wood Village Baptist Church, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, our community sponsors that help with all of our events, such as Advanced Mill and Wire, Atkins Dame Development, Teresa's Pet Food Supply, Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ron. I am confident I'm missing several others, but uh, those are the first ones that come to mind from being the big supporters of all of our events throughout the year. Great. And what are you personally most looking forward to? Having the event back, uh, you know, COVID took away a lot of stuff over the past year. We've been slowly bringing things back. Uh, this event has been going on for over 20 years, and we're just, I'm just excited to have uh, some stuff back to give to the community to forget about the past year and, you know, move forward in a really positive, fun way. Sounds wonderful. Thanks very much, Greg. We'll look forward to it. Thanks, Monica. Even when we're not aware of it, media impacts our lives every day. Metro East has been committed to providing access to media technology, training, and tools for people of all ages for over 30 years. Today on Community Hotline, we'll be learning about a brand new way the youth education team is engaging with the community. Getting out of the studio to meet youth where they're at with the Mobile Media Innovation Lab. Joining us today to talk a little bit more about the project is Seth Ring, the Director of Education, and Jessica Liu, the Director of Digital Equity and Inclusion at Metro East Community Media. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate uh, being able to talk to you guys. Hi, Monica. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, so tell us a little bit, if you would, about what the Mobile Media Lab actually is. Yeah. Um, so the, the Mobile Media Lab is a, um, it's a, Ford Transit, <laughs> a super long vehicle, um, that basically, you know, we are able to deliver what uh, Metro East does remotely to people. So we teach people how to use media equipment and software. And uh, through the Mobile Media Lab, we've done, we've gone to different places before, but it just makes it easier. And it gives us a much more sort of visible presence. So part of that, what 
what happened was, um, if you don't mind, I'll do a screen share so I can kind of walk you through it. We did some community listening sessions. We, we work with immigrants and refugees and BIPOC communities. Um, those are sort of our focus for um, our media education and digital inclusion work. And the feedback from our advisory board and from our listening session was it's difficult to get to places to sort of engage in programming with you. It'd be helpful if you came to us, which is sort of nothing new in the world of, of education is it's a lot easier if you deliver to people. And so what we're doing is we're delivering our programming to schools, nonprofits, um, in, in East County. Okay, so, and I imagine you'll also be going to uh, community events when we're back up and, and uh, every, doing everything in person, is that right? That's correct. So, and we want them to be sort of culturally focused. So we already have some options, you know, we were interested in Dia de los Muertos, um, potentially um, Vietnamese New Year, and then um, Eid, um, sort of, we're, we want them to be culturally focused and be a presence at those events, very visible so that people are aware of the services that we have to offer and um, get to experience a little bit of them too. That's what's cool about the Mobile Media Lab is it's, um, it's a way that we can be really visible at the, these events and also show off work that's been generated by people. So if you look right here, this is a, a side-mounted short throw projector so if we do a camp or something like that, or we work with a community, we can actually play their, their work back in a very um, publicly visible way. So um, let's see here. I think if, you, if we look a little bit closer, um, it's just an opportunity to be right there in, in the action where you know, the crowd is um, and share that with people. And what's nice about it too is it has its own power. So um, we can just plug in we can just plug in and be mobile and, and it has its own battery array so that we can basically just plug into it and run our software off of it. So in our equipment. So here's a um, picture of the battery array that's in it. So you, what is, what is the kind of things that, what are the kind of things you have in the van itself then? You, you showed the batteries, but what else is, yeah. what else is inside there for people well, to? play with that's right right now it's a bunch of boxes because it's <laughs> not done yet but um it's not branded yet but when it's done and polished um we'll have um basically you know we use ipads a lot um, macbook pros cameras um potential down the road some vr equipment like vr goggles uh basically stuff that's sort of well-rounded and it empowers people on certain software media software and that sort of thing so ipads are great for middle schoolers and people in general, they're very intuitive and you can put a lot of different like audio recording software, video recording software, VR software on it. And then for jobs that require a little bit more professional polish, then we'll, we'll have those MacBook Pros and really nice high-end cameras that can take photos and video for our sort of um, older age groups that we work with. Um, and so they'll be able to kind of create more polished products. So uh, laptops, iPads, VR equipment, um, and then all the software that's on those things too. Sounds, it sounds cool, it sounds fun. You, you talked about that you work a lot with immigrant and refugee populations and you talked about um, that this is to meet people where they are. What are, what are the actual goals of, of this project? I know that there's some DEI uh, focus on this. Um, maybe even you can talk about that, Jessica. What, 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 are your, what are the outcomes you're looking for from this work? Yeah, so um, much of like Seth was saying, the, the Mobile Media Innovation Lab is kind of like our code name for it right now. Uh, we still haven't named it. Um, but we've been running, uh, Metro East has been doing, you know, media education and digital inclusion programming for the past several years. Um, and this is just kind of like a way to deliver all of that really easily now, because before we were, we were kind of schlepping all of our equipment back and forth in bins. So now we have like a dedicated equipment to actually bring it to a place, the dedicated vehicles to charge everything. So we don't have to show up super early to the site and, you know, like set up our charging stations and everything. 
So that's one thing is like addressing the real like logistic need. One of our hopes is that our uh, community members will feel empowered by coming to these kind of classes and short workshops that we have. I mean, Metro East, we serve, you know, ages eight to 88. Uh, we have classes here that we have at Metro East, the actually on site and virtually now since of COVID. Um, but the mobile media lab is kind of a way to like disperse like samples of like what we kind of have. So like Seth was talking about one of our most popular programs is the film with iPhone uh, because it's really easy to kind of uh, tweak it to fit different communities. So people get kind of a taste of what we have to offer and hopefully maybe come back for more if they're if that's something that they find they're they're interested in or have an aptitude for or just really need perhaps for their for their job or their or school or whatever then they know where they can go for for more of it yeah and and i'd just say you know part of you know the digital inclusion end of things like you have to think of the spectrum of skill sets that we work with you know we have some people that they could jump on a professional camera and you know go film a really cool documentary but then we have people that have never used a keyboard or a mouse before you know it's we're trying to we're trying to kind of shift so that we make sure that those people that don't have the access to those tools or instruction have it available to them because we have a lot of you know historically excluded groups that just haven't had access to that kind of technology and training. We also make it a point to um, meet with um, each group that we work with before actually ro like rolling out programming. So whether it's a school or a community partner or an after school program, um, we like to meet with the teachers and the mentors who are actually going to be uh, doing the program and leading so that we make sure that our curriculum is actually in line with the things that that particular community is interested in. So you, you mentioned that the, the mobile um, lab is not named yet. <laughs> when are you going to name it? How's that going to happen? <laughs> Um, so we, we do plan on naming it, but, you know, in, in sort of the same spirit of we're sourcing from the population that we're trying to serve, um, I'm going to do a quick screenshot. Um, we have a survey that we've created, um, and it's, um, it's mostly right now, you know, the majority of people giving feedback on it because it's really aimed at kids, um, are, we're, we're trying to, source like from middle schools and high schools um, to get feedback on what they want out of the vehicle. So this is our branding survey right here. And it has a couple big segments. One is um, we're um, asking sort of what fonts they like to see. So we have these different font sets. And then the second part of it is sort of the motif. Like what is the look that you would want to see on this vehicle that would appeal to you? So we have like comic book, um, we have something that looks a little bit like Fortnite, which is a really popular video game and just in general video games, surprise, kids like video games, <laughs> adults do too, I like them. Um, and then uh, we had this sort of three tone look that's um, kind of prevalent on some certain websites like uh, Discord and Vimeo and sometimes Google. And then the last part is uh, we have, sorry, we have, um, we have a spaceship slash uh, race car look. And the last is urban street art. So something that maybe you'd see on a mural somewhere in the greater Portland area. So the first part is, what do you want it to look like? That's the survey we have out right now. The second part is gonna be, once we pick that motif and have our graphic designer um, sort of do up a mock-up of what the vehicle is gonna look like once it gets wrapped and branded, then we're going to send out a gigantic, you know, request to name the vehicle. A lot of people probably remember um, the Bodie McBoat face <laughs> scandal or just, you know, hubbub. Um, there's a vehicle in Britain that they tried to do this with. Um, and so the idea is we source, we're going to source the name from um, people in a big survey, and then we'll have our advisory board, we'll whittle that down to maybe the top five options of what we want to do, uh, what we want for that name. And then from that top five options, we'll pick um, the winner, the person that uh, picked the, the name for the vehicle. It's meant to be for kind of generally, you know, middle school to high school youth and obviously adults too. But 
if it were a little bit quirky, I don't think that'd be a bad thing. Metro East has been quirky since day one, so. <laughs> it has, it, it, it should be something original and fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sounds good. So you've talked a little bit about this program um, and then what, there are some other things you have going on this summer besides uh, taking the mobile uh, van out? The one that we, I would say is the most publicly available to people is we're doing a TikTok and YouTube camp with the Rockwood Library. Um, Seth was kind of mentioning how, uh, you know, we're starting to roll out education stuff. We've actually started doing it a little bit. Uh, we started doing some in May. Uh, and again, this is all kind of the curriculum that's been developed through kind of our uh, mobile media lab and uh, um, film with iPhone. Um, so we started in May with uh, BEAM, the Black Education Achievement Movement. Um, and we are uh, in partnership with BEAM um, and Portland Autobahn. Um, we're actually taking students out to three different field trips. Uh, students are learning about uh, place-based history. They're learning about uh, jobs in environmental sciences. And then they're also um, using our iPads to kind of like document this whole process. So last weekend, we actually went, or two weekends ago, we went on a tour with uh, Clive and Kyan Davis, and they are the founders of the Black Williams Project. So it was really cool, you know, we were walking around with um, these youth and then kind of using our iPads to film um, the whole tour, excuse me, the tour. Uh, and then we were kind of like, the theme was like a scavenger hunt. So students had to go around looking for specific sites um, at like specific placards um, or trying to get specific shot types. And that's just like, um, kind of kicked off our summer. We have next week coming up, uh, we're starting with Reynolds. Uh, Reynolds High School or Middle School? What it, middle School, yeah. Middle School, okay, great, great. Well, oh, that sounds like fun stuff so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, so most of these are already arranged. You already have set, set um, workshops or classes or camps or whatever, but the TikTok and the, um, the TikTok, uh, YouTube, YouTube class yeah. is is open to the public to the yeah. 11 to 18 year olds. That, yeah, that's right. And so there's only 20 seats available. You can find that on that link. Um, there's a set, there's a registration sign up there. It's through the library. So you like basically sign up in a Zoom portal webinar type thing. And once we hit that 20 person cap, then we can't take any more students. We have iPads, iPad kits with lights and a microphone that we'll be checking out to students for that and a tripod. Um, so that's sort of the one that's open to the public. And then we are doing something called Skip, which is Summer Kids in the Park with City of Gresham. We'll be doing um, park pop-ups the first three week in August. They're, we're just calling them media pop-ups. It's just like a little sample um, of different stuff. I think the first week is video. The next week is um, podcasting. And then the third week is a VR experience. And we're rotating between Nadaka, Red Sunset, and Gresham, Maine, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And our schedule's up on that web webpage as well. That's fun stuff. And, and people should realize if they like this, that they can uh, they can sign up to be members of Metro East and that they can continue to take the classes and check out our equipment and that it's, uh, it's you know, it's we make it very, very affordable for anybody. So they could just talk to us about it. We can get that going. So any any final thoughts or anything else you want us to know about uh, what, what Metro East Education Department is offering this summer or has coming up? We have some plans to get some the, some of the word out on like some EBB information and then we're planning on working with Wood Village they have a new uh, I keep forgetting the name of the building but it's a municipal a, building, a municipal building. <laughs> um, and that's supposed to be outfitted with um, you know rooms for the community a kitchen so we're looking to uh, pick up Welcome to Computers again because pick, Welcome to Computers was a, put on holds because of COVID. So we're uh, hoping to do that again with the new building at Wood Village. And the Welcome to Computers is a class. We, Seth talked about the different levels of competency um, with technology, and that's one for people who have a very low or limited um, exposure to, to technology. And, and it's for the immigrant refugee communities. Is that pretty much right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, any, any Seth, you said you wanted to 
Well, we'll be doing that. stuff with uh, Reynolds. Uh, let's see. We'll be doing stuff with Gresham Barlow School District um, and potentially, um, I think it's De La Salle High School. So a lot of it's, you know, school year programming. Um, but I'm going to echo what you said, Monica. You know, the whole idea is that, like, hopefully people experience these things and they come back to the mothership. We have <laughs> studios to record in. We have tons of equipment to check out. We're like an equipment lending library or like the library that check out really high-end gear to people and training that's very inexpensive. Um, you know, and, and we do offer scholarships for membership. If you can't afford it, we don't want to turn people down. Um, and that's the whole point is I think the thrust of everything we do is to get different voices out there than maybe what you see in, in the public mainstream, like on, on network TV, because, um, you know, people don't always have access to, to that kind of gear. And we're, we're trying to give that to you, to you so that you can, you know, talk about what you want to talk about, what's important to you and, and change the messaging that's out there. I like that. I like that. Get your, let your voice be heard. Thank you both very much. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate you coming on today. And um, for from all of us at Metro East, you know, thanks for watching and uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and do check out Metro East. Mm -hmm.